Now we're going to be talking about the physiology of the digestive system. And one of the things to keep in mind as we're discussing the digestive system is that much of what we think of as the digestive system is very familiar and approachable to us. Um, it's important not to think that you understand more than you do because um, a lot of what goes on in the digestive system is not particularly intuitive. Let's just talk about, in general, the four different things that your digestive system is responsible for. Um, ultimately, this is how the body is going to get the biomolecules that allow us to run all of our mitochondria so that the cells can stay alive. But it starts off with ingestion. And ingestion is uh, taking a bite of food um, and making it so that that bite of food can be swallowed. Um, ingestion, this taking a bite of food and swallowing it, seems very uh, simple. And yet for people who are disabled, particularly by a neuromuscular disorder or by a stroke, um, as well as the elderly, this very first step of ingestion can be very, very difficult, um, cause lots of problems. Our second step is simply digestion. Now, digestion is a regular English word, but we're talking about it from a science point of view, so it has a more specific uh, definition. The process of digestion is taking those bites of food, those mixtures of enormous biomolecules put into complicated cell and, and tissue structures, and turning them into the absorbable monomers, right? So the, the chunk of hot dog, that's not going in your bloodstream. Well, of course not, right? But even if you took that chunk of hot dog and you pureed it, that stuff's not going in your bloodstream either. Um, any individual protein or carbohydrate or lipid molecule has to be broken down into absorbable small molecules that are mostly the monomers that we learned at the beginning of class. Then we do need to have absorption. There's no point in doing the ingestion and the digestion if those individual monomers are not going to be able to be absorbed into your bloodstream so they can be distributed to the rest of the body. And lastly, out of all the stuff that we eat, um, there is stuff in there that we do not have the ability to break down into absorbable monomers. Uh, it, if we did, we would never need to defecate, but much of what we consume, we cannot be breaking it down to the point where it can be absorbed and used by the cells of our body. We gotta get rid of that, and that process is defecation. Now, we're talking about digestion, and just digestion is taking whatever that bite of food is and breaking it down to the point it can be absorbed um, into the bloodstream. And even that process, digestion, it gets broken down into two smaller categories. Digestion can be either mechanical digestion or chemical digestion. Mechanical digestion. Mechanical digestion, you can think of as anything that like a really powerful blender could do. If I took uh, the hamburger and fries and milkshake that you may have had for lunch and put it into a really good blender, I could turn it into hamburger, fries, shake, uh, juice or something like that. Okay, that would be mechanical digestion. It's this physical breakdown. Uh, mechanical digestion of foods in humans, it starts in the mouth because generally we are going to chew our food at least somewhat before we swallow it. And it is mostly complete by the time our food, whatever we've eaten, has left the stomach. Mostly it's complete at the end of that. Um, in some textbooks, you will see that they will describe mechanical digestion as still happening in the intestines, maybe a little bit, but by the time the, whatever you ate leaves your stomach, it's in the consistency of like a cream of mushroom soup. 
So most of the mechanical digestion certainly is completed by the time it has left your stomach. So your teeth start it when you chew, your stomach mostly completes it, yeah, the intestines. Chemical digestion. Chemical digestion um, does include what hydrochloric acid does, but in this uh, set of lectures, we are primarily going to be focusing on chemical digestion that is being done by enzymes. You had a whole 151 lab on enzymes back when we were still meeting on campus. Um, enzymes come from different parts of the body um, and enzymes do primarily hydrolysis reactions. Remember hydrolysis reactions? That was on exam one, so go back and review it if you no longer remember it. The hydrolysis reactions that are being done by these enzymes are very specific ones. And let me offer an analogy. Um, let's think about the different amino acids that build up a protein as being like those pop beads that kids can pop together to make a necklace or whatever. So the individual pop beads, you pop them together. And as you pop them together, you can make yourself a necklace. Great. Now, when I take that apart, I want to pop them apart so that I can put them in a stack and I can take them and put them back together again, right? If I were to take the pop bead necklace and cut it apart with scissors in some way, I would have dismantled it, but it would no longer be usable. The enzymes that are going to take a protein that you ate and dismantle it so it can be absorbed, it pops them apart so that they still are very reusable amino acids because to just cut it apart into smaller bits just so it can get into the body, that would not be useful. Just like cutting apart your pop bead necklace with scissors, it would be apart, but it would no longer be able to be put together again. So the hydrolysis reactions are going to break down the macromolecules, these large polymers, uh, starch, uh, triglycerides, and proteins into their individual monomers. For starch, what is it? Think a little bit. Yeah, for starch, it is monosaccharides. For proteins, it'll be the amino acids and fats we're thinking mostly about triglycerides. They get broken down into the monoglycerides and also fatty acids. Where do these enzymes come from? There are enzymes that are made by your salivary glands. There are enzymes made by your stomach. The pancreas and the intestines also make enzymes. This is an important point. Digestive enzymes are not made by the liver, okay? The liver doesn't make digestive enzymes. The liver makes something that's important for the digestion of fats, but it does not make digestive enzymes. In order to make this happen, what physiological processes do we need? We need motility. Um, you, in order to do uh, chewing, you're going to need muscle contraction with skeletal muscle. Um, in order to do the mechanical digestion the stomach does, we need the muscle contraction of smooth muscle, which is not conscious. We're also going to need, as we swallow and as we move food along the length of the intestinal tract, we're going to need rhythmic contractions of smooth muscle that will um, uh, move the substances along the length of the tube. Okay. So we're going to need motility. We're also going to need secretion. Secretion is that bulk exocytosis that happens when packages of proteins like filled with enzymes, right, go to the surface of the cell and get exocytosed out into the outside world. And in the case of our enzymes, they're going to get put into tubes that get input to put bigger tubes that end up dumping stuff into the mouth or the stomach or the intestines. Um, secretion is also needed for uh, uh, the secretion of hormones into the bloodstream. Now that kind of secretion uh, with 
we learned was a part of the endocrine system. And it's interesting that particularly that first part of the small intestine, the duodenum, it actually makes a number of very important hormones that tell you when you've eaten and that orchestrate, that organize other organs like the pancreas with the intestinal tract to get them doing what they need to do at the right moment. Ultimately, we're going to need the active transport of these monomers into the bloodstream. Um, you, we learned in our last set of lectures that oxygen and carbon dioxide, that they are busy moving things just by passive processes, largely by diffusion, right? But getting things into the cells of your body that um, you want to absorb into your bloodstream, that is primarily something that happens by active transport. So since we need smooth muscle to be moving things along the digestive tract and the stomach needs to be moving, all of that actually needs to be coordinated. And it's not coordinated the way the heart does it. The heart had its own way of doing things. The, uh, the intestinal tract is actually filled with many, 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 many neurons. There are as many neurons in your digestive system as there are in your brain. So people who study the neural networks of the intestinal tract, uh, they often think of these neurons as being um, sort of equivalent to another form of intelligence that the body has. And there are two primary neural networks. There is the myenteric plexus. The myenteric plexus is going to be organizing these two layers, two layers in the intestinal tract of smooth muscle that form the um, muscularis layers, right? You learned that circular inner layer and the longitudinal outer layer the um, stomach has got a third layer, but that is uh, coordinated by the myenteric plexus. And remember everything myo means muscle. <clears throat> there is a second plexus and it is busy talking to all of the glands that are here in the submucosa. And so it's called the submucosal plexus. Uh, this submucosal plexus also allows this inner layer of muscle, the muscularis mucosa, to respond to anything sharp that might be inside of the intestinal tract. You know, some of the stuff that we chew and swallow, particularly stuff that has a lot of uh, like um, hard fiber in it, like bran, it can be actually rather sharp inside of the intestinal tract. But this layer, the muscularis mucosa, is partly responsible for allowing the inside of the intestinal tract to flinch away from anything sharp that's inside of the intestinal tract. So make sure you know the two neural networks and which one does which. Okay, there are fancier names for there. So uh, the uh, it's important to remember that the um, an enteric nervous system this nervous system of the gastrointestinal system is independent of the central nervous system. Um, why is that important? It does mean that when someone is paralyzed because they've had a, an injury, for example, to the spinal cord in their neck, um, they no longer will be able to bleed, breathe voluntarily, so they're going to need breathing assistance. But thank goodness, their intestinal tract will still continue to work. And so we can uh, feed uh, people um, by mouth or through a uh, feeding tube into their stomach. And the intestinal tract will continue to move normally uh, because it is independent of the central nervous system. So please remember the submucosal plexus is controlling the stuff that's here in the submucosa. The muscularis mucosa is the boundary of the submucosa, right? But the myenteric plexus, it controls those uh, two thicker outer layers of smooth muscle. Um, and let's talk a moment about peristalsis. 
That word peristalsis is used very often when we're talking about the digestive tract. And peristalsis is a coordinated movement of the circular layer and the longitudinal layers of the um, digestive tract. Um, they coordinate in a way that allows substances to be moved purposefully down the length of the tube. Whenever you swallow, you initiate a peristaltic wave, which is moving the food from your pharynx down to your stomach. So please remember the word peristalsis. And alternate waves of longitudinal and circular muscular contraction that pushes food along the alimentary canal. Uh, the, the digestive tract, that tube that goes through us, is also known as the alimentary canal. Oh, one more thing you need to know, and you should remember it from 151. You should remind yourself of the path that food takes through the digestive tract. So as a recap, it starts in the mouth and it goes to the oropharynx, then the laryngopharynx, then down the esophagus. It goes in through the lower esophageal sphincter into the stomach. Spend some time in the stomach. It will leave the stomach through the pyloric sphincter into the small intestine. Please know the parts of the small intestine in order. The first part is the duodenum, then the jejunum, then the ileum. So duodenum starts with a D, jejunum starts with a J. So you could remember it as the world's geekiest DJ, DJ ileum, right? So the duodenum, jejunum, ileum. The last part of the ileum is going to meet with the first part of the large intestine. The large intestine is also called the colon. Um, and the door between the small intestine and the large intestine is the ileocecal valve. The large intestine starts with the colon, the appendix hangs off. The large intestine starts with the cecum, the appendix hangs off of the cecum. Then food will go up the ascending colon, across the transverse colon, down the descending colon, through the sigmoid colon, then rectum, then anus, right? We will start here at the beginning of our next video.